So that was interesting, yeah? I'll have to be as interesting. So you like this? This is given to me by uh, uh, the slide by uh, a fellow from a big telco. So you can sort of see what they're thinking. Um, so what I want to talk about is I want to talk about the universal people sensors and what are the pluses and minuses and where we're going. Uh, so these are people moving around in San Francisco, the most likely stores, and by watching what people do, you can tell what their preferences are. Now, I should mention uh, that I'm on the board of Motorola, Telefonica, Nissan, Renault, so I know something about this. And the last speaker made it very clear that there's a lot of information that you can get out of this data. Uh, and the normal reaction that people have is, oh my god, <laughs> I've got to stop this. Um, and I'm going to tell you that that's wrong. I think that you should rename this conference, not privacy, but something having to do with data as an asset. And it's an asset that you should control, not the companies. And that's really the question, is who controls the data, and can you be secure in sharing it for particular purposes? Um, so let me give you some quick examples. So uh, for the car company, it turns out that if I can watch all those GPS things that are in your cars nowadays, there are many circumstances where I can predict whether or not you will have an accident with about a 50% chance in the next two or three seconds. Because if I watch somebody else and they have a braking event and you're going down the same place at a slightly higher speed, it turns out you are at great risk. So don't you want to share that data so you can have your kids grow up so that you can continue to have a whole body? Maybe. Or here's another one. We built a system, this is for returning soldiers, but I think it'll be available. It watches you on your phone, it looks at your socialization, your physical activity, how the pattern of your life, and it turns out that those are diagnostic criteria, formal medical diagnostic criteria for mental diseases like depression, like PTSD, like schizophrenia. So you can on your phone visualize your mental social health in terms that are understandable, focus, activity, social. And what this does is this uses a system I'll talk about in just a second to share data in a highly secure manner so that you can see how you compare to people like you. Because when people see these things, they say, oh, it's just a bad day or I'm a bad person. But when they begin to compare with other people, they realize that maybe they should take action about this. I should mention that the mental diseases, in terms of disability, are the number one health problem in the world. More than cancer, more than war, you name it. That's the thing that is the burden of humanity. And we can actually watch it. And through sharing, we can begin to do things about it. Here's another one. You're all familiar with pandemics and flu, and, and you know about Google flu, OK? But it turns out that if I can watch your phones on a minute-by-minute -minute basis, how you move, who you call, where you go, I can do a really good job of telling if you've been infected with the flu. And if I can watch the people around you, I can do a tremendously good job of actually watching the flu move from person to person to person. Now, that's George Orwell to cube power, okay? It's the most invasive thing you can imagine. But now here's the trade-off. There are no protections today against pandemics. The vaccines don't really work. They have huge side effects. Not everybody takes them anyhow. So you have to ask, are there conditions under which we're going to allow this level of spying on people? Or are we going to just let the 200 million people die? Because that's what's predicted for the next pandemic. Those are the trade-offs. So what I'm telling you is really important, is the big data, this sort of invasive data, has rewards, public goods, public goods that cannot really be ignored because the lives of your kids depend on them. They also have enormous risks, which I think the people in this room are very sensitive to. What are we going to do? Well, 
I was concerned enough about this that about five years ago, I convinced the World Economic Forum to start a discussion about this with the Vice President of the EU, a representative from the US National Security Agency, the Chairman of the Federal Trade Commission, the Chairman of Vodafone, the Chairman of uh, Microsoft, and on and on, as well as advocacy groups. And our conversation centered around what I call the New Deal on data. Because in my view, the politics of this are that we should not be talking about privacy. We should be talking about how we can get public goods to save our kids, to make our life better, to cure global warming. We can actually do amazing things on problems like that, while at the same time making sure the companies don't go bankrupt. Wouldn't be any good to let them go bankrupt. But also, it has to be something that's in the direct and immediate interest of the citizens, of the consumers. It has to be a win-win-win solution. And the results of this conversation were put out in a thing that's called personal data emergence of a new asset class. And what it argues is that the value in data is when it flows and is shared. That's how you save kids. That's how you make the buses run on time. That's how you buy the consumer goods that make your life maybe more interesting. Um, and if it's a good, if it's a, a, a public, if it's, if it's a good, then it's something that is a, an asset. And the first question you have to ask about asset is who owns this asset? It's like land, right? The first question is title to the asset. And the only politically viable thing, and industry agrees with this, obviously government does, is that individuals have to own, in some sense, data about them. Now that's difficult in various ways, but I'll show you how you can do a lot of it, okay? So we've gotten people, the industries we just talked about, bought off on the idea that individuals have to control data about them, they have to have ownership in the sense of old English law, common law, the rights of disposal, the rights to take back data, the right to know where the data went. And these have helped shape uh, the EU uh, initiative on human rights and data and the Consumer Privacy Bill of Rights here in the United States. And in the last Davos, they have these wonderful artists who, who draw the conversation as you do it. Um, we had an industry response to these regulatory proposals, and it was clearly we have to have true informed consent, no more EULAs, no more terms and conditions as they are today. People were enthusiastic, this is industry, mind you, right? Industry was enthusiastic by the idea that all personal data would be legally required to have metadata that gives the provenance, who gave permissions, what exactly were the permissions, and that that has to be attached to the data. And what that lets you do is that lets you automatically audit where the data goes, who has it, what they did with it, and were they compliant with the original permissions and the local law. It also lets you revoke permissions. To say, I <laughs> don't like what you're doing with my data. Give it back. And because it's auditable, you can enforce that. Let me tell you a little bit about it. Uh, it's not just a computer science problem, uh, but we've built a sort of reference standard. So together with uh, NGO, we have Institute for Data Driven Design. John Klippinger, who was head of the Harvard Law Lab, and myself set this up. We've built reference standard software that implements these ideas. It's open source, it's available for everyone. It includes things like OpenID Connect. So uh, we, uh, some of my guys uh, uh, help chair the National Strategy for Trusted Identity in Cyberspace, uh, NSTIC, and so Daza Greenwood. And as part of that, we've uh, taken over from the military um, some technology for highly secure uh, identity assurance in order to get rid of passwords and get rid of many of the other things that go along with that. But importantly, it's not just a technical solution. There has to be a legal solution. Not new laws, as the last speaker pointed out, because that's like really unlikely to happen. But it turns out that in contract law, you can do a very good job of enforcing data sharing, data privacy, data ownership rights just by contracts. And that's wonderful because it's interoperable among different jurisdictions. 
Okay? And an example is the SWIFT network for interbank transfer. There's no laws about it. It's just a peer-to-peer -peer contract where the contract and the actual technical computer science messaging are one-to-one. -one. The messages implement contracts. The contracts can be reduced directly into computer code. And that combination of the two is what gives you security because you can know precisely what's happening and it's enforceable under a contract law uh, uh, framework. And in fact, in the contract already is written in harms and remedies and mediation. So you don't have to hire lawyers. You don't have to, sorry, for those of you who are lawyers, you don't have to go to court. Another thing that's in the system uh, that is best practice is people talk about sharing data. Most times that's stupid. You don't need to share data. You need to share answers. So the system here has a secure way of answering questions if and all you want. And that way you can answer the minimum amount of information possible, like yes, I'm interested, or yes, I'm in San Francisco, not your exact location. So we've spun this up in various places. Uh, for instance, in Trento, we've got the government there, um, the local telcos, the bus company, the power company, to adopt this framework and experiment it to look at how secure is it, how does sharing data help? I mentioned some of the public goods at the beginning. And how do people feel about it? So we're starting with young families and with elders and giving them the ability to share data and see data in a way that hasn't been possible before. Um, and that's the point of spinning these things up, is to get facts on the ground. Too many of these conversations are done in policy. It's all just talk, 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 no facts. We're going to get facts. Let me give you one more example and then conclude. So one of the things that comes out of this type of reasoning is, is that there ought to be a data commons. We have taxes. We have public information that the government supplies. Why doesn't this data that we're all talking about have a commons? And so I helped talk Orange into creating what is probably the first large big data commons. It's in the country of the Ivory Coast which had a civil war that ended about uh, two years ago at this point. And what they did is they released all the telephone records for the entire country, along with financial data, et cetera, et cetera, but aggregated in a very interesting way. And with legal agreements under contract law, as I just talked about. And we recruited almost 90 universities from all around the world to look at this data, ask was it safe? Could you break it? Could you re-identify people? And what could you do that was a public good? Some of the public goods is we figured out how to reduce commute time by 10% in the big city. That's enormous. Uh, we figured out how to radically improve their malaria uh, mitigation strategy and their reaction to pandemics. We also were able for the first time to produce something that's like census data. In a place that's just done with a civil war, millions dead, you don't have census. You don't know where poverty is. You don't know where the kids are dying. It turns out you can use this data to determine where the kids are dying with very high accuracy because people have reliable behavioral changes uh, when they're in different conditions. And you could even look at ethnic divisions in a way that had never been possible before. And of course, those ethnic divisions are the source of the Civil War. So those are some of the public goods. And I will notice 90 teams university teams, people who are experts at this, no one was able to re-identify anything. No one was able to do anything particularly bad. And if they had, we would have thrown the suckers in jail because they had signed a contract that said they were going to do this and only this, and they would not let the data go further. So we had them, <laughs> OK? So what's next? Well, there's a lot of things that are next. So this is me uh, 15 years ago. Um, this is when we invented the things that are now Google Glass. My student there in front, Thad, is actually the technical lead for Google Glass. So we literally started all of that. And I can tell you the privacy debates around that uh, were rather intense. And that is why Google Glass flashes and makes noises when it takes pictures. Now, we had some other security elements to it, which they haven't yet put in, but one can imagine that uh, They'll go in that direction. And I can also tell you that, um, you know, this type of thing is just the beginning. 
you're going to see far more data about far more things, publicly available, personally available, than you can even imagine. And it's up to us to figure out how to turn that into a public good rather than just simply to lock it down. So safety for individuals, but public good. Please don't forget the public good. I want my kids to grow up safe. <laughs>